started. We have two speakers this afternoon, um, and the topic is newsreels. And so again, I'll uh, introduce Kira Chambers and Mary McAuliffe, uh, but I'll give kind of Kira a full introduction now just before her talk, and we'll have questions and answers at the end. So Dr. Kira Chambers is Head of the Department of Film and Screen Media at the University College Cork, and a council member of the International Association of Media and History. She was screenwriter and associate producer of Era Nandurskalan, a broadcasting authority of Ireland funded television series for TG Carr, based on her book Ireland is a Newsreels. And she's an Irish PI in the AHRC, IRC funded project Make Film History, which opens up archival collections to emerging filmmakers. So welcome, Kira. Thanks, Sarah. So um, thanks to Ross and Suniva and Sarah and Dennis um, for organising this uh, wonderful event and bringing us all together today. I find it really illuminating. Just I hope, hope I don't lower the standard too much now. Um, I'd also like to thank Kaz. Um, the Irish Independence Film Collection is a really wonderful project and I'll be showing some clips from it today. But it's part of a much broader series of archival projects that have brought the Irish Film Archive to the attention of the International Archive Network. The, the work that's done here by Kaz and her colleagues in the archives is spectacular, it really is, and has such a wonderful reputation. And it's a source of great pride that we can celebrate our national archive and um, not just the preservation that it undertakes, but getting the material out to the general public um, through access projects like the Irish Independence Film Collection, but also through the programming that Suniva does as well. So um, it's, it, it really is a, a wonderful resource that we have. Um, so I'm going to talk about the revolutionary period in um, Irish newsreels, except when I say the word Irish newsreels, they're not exactly Irish because most of the material I'll be talking about um, is British in origin. Um, I am aware that I am in the presence of esteemed historians here, both as part of the program of speakers and also in the audience. So if I make any factual errors, please correct me. Or if I misrepresent any historical nuances, please correct me as well. Um, so just to give some background on the cinema newsreel as a form, it is the only form of moving image news available to the general public before the widespread advent of television in the 1950s. So it's shown in the collective viewing space of the cinema, appropriate that we're watching some of these here today. And um, because they were shown in a place of entertainment, um, cinema exhibitors did not want their audiences upset or offended on an afternoon or an evening out. So the newsreels tended to operate a sort of a self-censorship when it came to um, controversial material or challenging material. This was a bit of a problem when it came to Ireland because so much was controversial um, during the revolutionary period and the newsreels really struggled um, with reporting some of the events that occurred. So the first newsreel was produced for Charles Pathé in 1909 and by the outbreak of World War I it was really firmly established as a, as a part of the cinema programme. Because Ireland was on the British distribution circuit, um, there was very little local newsreel production. I'll talk about the, the small instance that there was in a minute. But because it was on the British distribution circuit, that meant that audiences watched material that was made mostly by British companies. Even though some of those companies had international parent companies, the material was very pro-British and pro-establishment in outlook. Um, there was one exception to this during the, the, the history of the newsreels, and that was Irish Events, which was produced by English-born Norman Witten and filmed by Gordon Lewis, who later became a, a cameraman for Pathé. So Irish Events ran sporadically between 1917 to 1920. Um, and interestingly, the tagline was, British for the British, Irish Events for the Irish. Mm -hmm. So it was clear that and there was an acknowledgement that local news was kind of important during this era and there, there, there was an absence of that local voice so Irish events in the short time it ran became quite important so however because it didn't run for for very long um, it meant that the war of independence and the civil war and going back to 1916 the rising were largely covered by British companies which were very selective in their reporting um, and sometimes they even actively misinformed audiences as we will see so it's clear from the few instances of Irish events that exist that they took a very different tone. So I'm going to try and compare. I am going to jump forward and back in time a little bit. So I hope that's not too confusing for you or for me. Let's see. Um, so what was evident in the British newsreels in particular? Sorry, I should be pointing at this rather than at the screen, shouldn't I? <laughs> 
um, was a partitionist mentality in the way that the, the British newsreels in particular represented Ireland. And this happened long before partition, long before there was ever a boundary commission. There was this sense of representing two very different territories. And the North was very much uh, associated with kind of um, industry and progress. And the South was much more agricultural in, in these representations. Occasionally, it's suited to suggest that North and South were, were working together, as in this World War I propaganda film that suggested, suggested that soldiers from throughout the country were working together in the war effort, um, and that if they were working together in the war effort, then surely they could put their differences aside at the end of the war when home rule returned to the political agenda again. But actually, this is a very good um, representation of propaganda, and it was interesting the question earlier talking about propaganda and entertainment um, and objective journalism. The newsreels are not so much about objective journalism and much more about propaganda and entertainment. So this particular um, newsreel was quite misleading, suggesting that the soldiers were, were fighting together was not exactly accurate because Unionist soldiers and Nationalist soldiers were um, enrolled in, in or registered in different regiments. So um, even when there are suggestions here about particular towns in Belgium where they were fighting side by side, it wasn't actually true. So um, it showed kind of the newsreels were quite willing to use um, Irish affairs or represent Irish affairs in a way that was uh, quite propagandistic. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the same was coverage of the Easter Rising in 1916. Um, and that coverage really showed the damage done to Dublin's architectural heritage um, and reminded audiences that there was a larger global conflict going on and the suggestion was that um, some sections of the Irish community were really selfish and insular in their approach while there was a broader global conflict going on. Um, so again, the tone here is very kind of pro-British. Um, in general terms, in the 1910s and the 1920s, we continue to see this partitionist mentality. So the North is associated with the monarchy, with royal visits, with the iconography of unionism, particularly through lots of Orange Order marches and rallies. Um, and the North is also associated, as I mentioned, as a, with, with industry, with progress, with the shipyards and so on. Um, the South, on the other hand, is shown to be much more agricultural, much more rural, but also very much associated with an inherent violent disposition. So um, in representations of the Easter Rising, the War of Independence, the Civil War, there are lots of these smoky shots of conflict, lots of damaged buildings and lots of shots of the aftermath of conflict. So there's a real kind of suggestion here that Ireland is doing damage to itself um, in the pursuit of independence. Um, so there are a couple of reasons for this um, in terms of showing the aftermath. Well, that was partly because newsreels didn't always get there on time to film the action. <laughs> they had quite cumbersome equipment, so it wasn't always easy. Um, but also, of course, they were beholden to British ideals and values. Often they didn't understand the difficult, the, the different and challenging political viewpoints. So it's quite complex to even understand, never mind represent. Um, but also they were beholden to a, a British um, agenda. When we come to um, Irish events, there's a slightly different um, focus. So as an example, um, when the funeral of Thomas McCurtain, Lord Mayor of Cork, was covered by Pathé, um, there was no mention that he had been killed by RIC officers, because this was part of a broader pattern um, of not representing kind of any misdemeanors on the part of either any of the British sections of the forces or anyone associated with them or acting on their behalf. Um, there's no context really given um, in terms of, of, of his death. But when we come to Irish events, again, not much context given here. However, what they do include is a, um, a, a shot of his wife and children at the graveside, which showed the ability of the Irish events cameraman to get closer to what was going on, to be in a more intimate space, and also the fact that this offers a human element, um, which isn't there in the Pathé uh, coverage. Um, when we get to events like the burning of Cork, and this says the only British news film, Topical Budget, because that was one that was kind of established um, in Britain, but the others had international parentage. So here we have Ireland's agony, desolation follows mystery fires in Cork. Well, they, yeah, mystery. I know that's kind of amazing that, that that word is included there. Not so much mystery to the unfortunate residents of Cork who watched the Black and Tans and the auxiliaries set fire to the city and stop firefighters tackling the blazes. Um, but of course, 
the, this topical budget, British Newsreel is not going to allude to that. Again, there was that broader kind of pattern of, of not condemning or even representing much of the um, military rampages that were, were happening at that time. And so, unsurprisingly, there was no coverage of um, the attacks in Crow Park on Bloody Sunday. And um, that would have been just too much for the newsreels to cope with. Um, what we do have, however, is a reference to the events of Bloody Sunday in this item, the murdered officers. So this represents the funerals of the British officers who had been shot earlier that morning on the orders of Michael Collins. So again, you see a kind of a bias here in terms of what they chose to represent and what they chose to, to leave out. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I see you. And up there. So, uh, sorry, I, I just feel uh, f for some people who are not very familiar with Irish history, yeah. it would be very helpful if you were to say, that the attack on the four courts uh, uh, was the start of the Irish Civil War, whereas what we've just seen was during the War of Independence. Yes. Uh, if, if you were to give us the context okay. and the dates, it would I will be do that. I'm very sorry. sorry. And I did, I did mention, I thought that might be a little bit confusing when I'm going mm. back and forward between events. So thank you for pointing that out. And mm. stop me again. <laughs> if, 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 if it's Yes, okay. So, so what I'm going to do now is go back to um, I'm going to uh, go back to the signing of the treaty. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about the signing of the treaty in December 1921. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit uh, about um, the newsreel's approach to this, and what we might see here is spin, as as we might now understand it to be. So the newsreels were certainly prone to spinning certain events in a way that again supported um, a pro-British narrative. So here we have this intertitle from Topical Budget, um, Irish Free State, after centuries of strife, Britain adds a contented new dominion to the crown. Um, not so contented in all quarters, I think. Um, and again, we have this newsreel from December uh, 1921, just a few days after the signing of the treaty. Splendid news, says the king, his smile reflects the Irish sunshine. So again, a very optimistic reading of the signing of the treaty. We see the delegates, firstly the British delegates and then the Irish delegates. They're all looking very relaxed and collegial. Um, no sense of the very protracted and difficult negotiations that had happened at this stage. So a very optimistic take on the signing of the treaty. No sense that it might not have been so optimistically received in all quarters in Ireland. And we have intertitles like this saying where the peace was signed, the welcome agreement. This is suggesting that the treaty represents an end to the Irish conflict, the end of, of the Irish problems. Here we have a solution. Isn't this great? So the newsreels were very celebratory of this moment. Um, no sense, of course, of foreboding of what might come later. And we even see shots here of, of Michael Collins kind of laughing, looking fairly relaxed. Um, and yet eight months later, the newsreels would be reporting on his funeral. Um, so. Uh, um, with with this kind of um, rhetoric in the newsreels, it's 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 very one sided. When we look back at how this period is covered in Irish newsreels, it's very very one sided. Um, <clears throat> okay, I want to jump back now, and I hope this isn't too con too confusing. Um, I want to compare the coverage of Path and Irish events of the death of Terence McSweeney. Okay, so. So this is Pathé, okay? So this is during the War of Independence. Um, it's a, quite an important event, an important moment. Um, the intertitle here suggests that Cork was outwardly calm on receipt of the news, but military patrolled the city unceasingly. So there's a sense here that, um, there's a sense of letting the audience know that um, the, the British military have control over the city of Cork. Should there be any um, uprising here over the death of um, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm so confused trying to trying to keep track on the on all the events. There's a sense here that the newsreels are are recommending or or suggesting that there won't be any problem because the British uh, military are in control. And this wasn't just for. Um, this wasn't just for audience members in Ireland, this was also for audience members across Britain. So what the newsreels are trying to say, sorry, did you want to come I, in again? I, I'm, I'm very sorry, it's just people might not necessarily know. Um, uh, Thomas McCurtain uh, was uh, Lord Mayor of Cork. He was a friend uh, of Terence McSweeney. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so um, Thomas McCurtain uh, was 
uh, assassinated by the yes. British. Yes. And uh, then Terence McSweeney became Lord Mayor of Cork after him. And uh, he went on a hunger strike. I think it lasted 72 or 74 days. He was uh, imprisoned in Brixton yes. Prison in, in London. And uh, when he died then, so it wasn't that he just died. Uh, uh, it, 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 the whole business was followed internationally, as was, uh, it was yes. a very powerful uh, s statement of commitment to uh, a free, independent Ireland. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. So yes, it was 74 days of hunger strikes, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yes, he did die in Brixton and it was internationally covered. And what I um, wanted to show here was that in the British coverage, there's a focus on um, the military being under control, not any of that context. So there's no context given whatsoever. When we move to Irish events, <coughs> there's a slightly different focus. OK, so this is the Irish newsreel representing um, events from within Ireland as opposed to the British perspective. So what we have here um, is a sense of perhaps a more intimate space being entered again by the newsreel cameraman. It's not playing. It's Okay. So uh, what I was trying to suggest there is that Irish events have a much more kind of intimate coverage. There are shots um, of the coffin, overhead shots of the coffin. There is no military presence represented in the Irish events newsreel. So there's no there's no extra context given either, but there's definitely a slightly different tone. Um, and again, as was similar with the coverage of Thomas McCurtain, a more a more humanistic element to the representation of, of Irish events. Okay, so um, this kind of tone in Irish events continued with uh, a, an item from 1920 called the Agony of Belfast. And this was again filmed by the Irish events company as opposed to any of the, the British newsreels. And this particular item showed uh, children playing in the rubble in a loyalist area of Belfast. You can see murals in the background. And it also showed an implied eviction of a Catholic family and the children again outside the house. So in that suggestion, there is a sense of here are the victims of the conflict. And um, regardless of which side they come from, there's a sense that the, the conflict as a whole is being condemned. And if that wasn't obvious enough in the visuals, there's an intertitle which states um, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. And that's a reference to Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. So the suggestion in that particular item, again by Irish events rather than British newsreels, is that all are punished in the conflict. Um, so again, we get a sense that Irish events has a slightly more nuanced approach, even if it doesn't have all of the context that we might like for these very complicated events, it does have a more nuanced uh, approach to the, the news that it, that it covers. <coughs> Okay, so I think now we can talk about De Valera and Collins. So after the signing of the treaty, there's a split in terms of newsreel coverage of Michael Collins and Eamon De Valera. So Michael Collins is uh, obviously seen to be associated with the signing of the treaty as a signatory. So the British newsreels are happy to endorse him from this point on, even though he wreaked havoc during the War of Independence against the British. From this point in the newsreels, Michael Collins is depicted almost in positive terms because he's associated with what is seen to be this this British solution to the Irish problem. Eamon de Valera as anti-treaty on the other hand becomes the villain um, and what Rita mentioned earlier as the kind of the dev phobia we see this in the newsreels of the 1920s onwards um, and it became even more pronounced in the 1930s and 1940s. So De Valera is shown to be this kind of dark, ominous, sinister figure in the newsreels, always dressed in black, always stern and um, very foreboding. Whereas Collins is often shown laughing or joking or uh, kind of in a more um, um, approachable way. So this was particularly evident when it came to the, the funeral of Michael Collins because his funeral was covered extensively. But also um, in terms of even after the treaty was signed, there's a notion that Collins has huge support. You'll see here from these shots and um, that he has widespread support and therefore there's widespread endorsement of the treaty. So that's obviously, as we know, not ex not exactly accurate. 
um, Collins is shown in kind of really powerful ways and there are specific camera techniques used to make him powerful. So this low angle shot where he's taking off a lot of the frame suggests visually to the viewer that he's, he's very powerful. So there is again that kind of visual aesthetic sense of supporting the treaty um, in the newsreel's approach to these, these events. Um, and again, De Valera on the other hand is, is, is uh, called an extremist. There are various other names used for him. But when it comes to talking about De Valera, there's a real sense that he might um, upend everything because he's this kind of dark, sinister figure. So here we have him leaving the mansion house after denouncing the treaty. There's a real sense that um, everything could become unstable because of this figure. So it's really simplistic, really reductionist, the way the newsreels approach um, the, these uh, figures from history. But there's also a sense that they're also entertaining their audiences by creating a bit of drama. So here we have Dublin's attitude is obvious. Mr. Griffith and Mr. Michael Collins, who signed the treaty, were wildly welcomed home. So here again, we have the, the propaganda. Um, <clears throat> There's a very interesting um, item here, which talks about a, a melancholy interest in these pictures because here's Collins at the site of Arthur Griffith's grave. So this is just after Collins has been killed and there's a sense here, oh, now our two treaty signatories are gone, two well-known treaty signatories, of course there are others, but these two in particular are highlighted. And that means now there's an instability um, in, in relation to the treaty. So <clears throat> I'm going to. Um, Sorry, I think you have a question there. Sorry, just as time. chair, do you mind oh. if we keep questions to the end? Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. So just very briefly, I won't, I won't go into too much more detail because I know I'm running out of time. So in terms of um, exploration of the Civil War, the newsreels, as you might guess, were quite pro-treaty in, in terms of their coverage, um, and more sympathetic to treaty supporters during the Civil War. But there was an ongoing notion that Ireland was inherently violent, um, really predisposed to violence, and that kind of continued in other cinematic representations after that. Um, I want to take a slight leap now, and hopefully the, the, the clip will play, through to World War II, Okay, so the um, newsreels had a kind of an influence internationally because, as you mentioned, there are certain events in Ireland that were covered internationally and some of these newsreels would have been shown um, across the world. And I think that that has an interesting connection with some of the anti-British Nazi propaganda in World War II. So this is a film called My Life for Ireland, made by, directed by Max, Max Kimmich in 1941. He was the brother-in-law of Joseph, Joseph Goebbels, Nazi propaganda minister, who realized that actually the Irish War of Independence could be an interesting setting for Nazi propaganda that was anti-British, showing the colonial abuses of the British. So this particular film um, uses the Irish War of Independence as a kind of narrative device to um, suggest that, that, that there is a widespread colonial abuse of, of the British in any territories that they might have been associated with. So I think if we can scroll forward. Um. If we might have time, yeah, yeah, okay. So um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it instead. So the, the footage in this particular clip is almost replicating the scenes that we see in newsreels during the, the War of Independence and the Civil War, the, all those smoky shots of battle. It's so similar what we see in this particular propaganda film from, from 1941. But interestingly, as propaganda, it kind of backfired because there's a, there's a real tendency for the British in the film to be um, dressed and to look like Nazis. And also they have a weird book burning sequence in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. So when the film was shown in the occupied territories, People said, hang on a minute here, um, they, I, I see something um, <clears throat> slightly askew here and it was read as a sort of a, um, a, a suggestion to uprise against the Nazis so up, um, and to, to um, rebel against Nazi occupation. So it didn't quite work as Nazi <coughs> propaganda as Goebbels had hoped. Instead, it was read as resistance propaganda, um, so it totally backfired. Okay, I'll, I'll have to finish up now, but just to say that newsreels are often dismissed as um, a source because they're hugely manipulable, as you can see, but um, they do tell us quite a lot about what people were shown and told about particular events 
Um, and also I think they show us some of the stereotypes that emerged in terms of the visual representation of Ireland. Also I think that some of the values of news that we see in the newsreels as a form are still evident um, in news across a variety of platforms today. Okay, and I will leave it there. <laughs>